of omega, which is 10 t plus pi over 2. So you see that the initial conditions, what the conditions are t equals 0, they determine my a and they determine my phase angle. If you had chosen this as the phase angle, 3 pi over 2, that would have been fine. You would have found a minus sign here, and that's exactly the same. So you would have found nothing different. I want to demonstrate to you that the period of oscillations, non-intuitive as that may be, is independent of the amplitude that I give the object. And I want to do that here with this air track. I have a, an object here. This object has a mass 186 plus or minus 1 gram. Call it M1. I'm going to oscillate it, and we're going to measure the period. But instead of measuring one period, I'm going to measure 10 periods, because that gives me a smaller uncertainty, a smaller relative error in my measurements. So I'm going to do it as an amplitude, which is 15 centimeters. Let's make it 20 centimeters. So I get 10 T. I get a certain number. And I get an error, which is my reaction error, which is about a tenth of a second. That's about the reaction error that we all have, roughly. Then I will do it at 40 centimeters. We get a 10 T. And we get, again, plus or minus 1 point, 0 point 0.1 seconds. And we'll see how much they differ. They should be the same if this is an ideal spring within the uncertainty of my measurements. You see the timing there. I'm going to give it a 20 centimeter offset, which is here. And then I will start it when it comes back here. So I will allow it one oscillation first. That's easier for me to see it stand still when I start it. There we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What do we see? 15.16. 15.16 seconds. By the way, you can derive the spring constants from this now, because you know the mass and you know the time. Now I'm going to give it a displacement, an amplitude, which is twice as high. So I make it 40 centimeters. So this is 10. 40 centimeters, a huge displacement. Now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Fifteen point one three. Fantastic agreement within the uncertainty of my measurements. Like they are within three hundredths of a second. Of course, if you try it many times, you won't always get that close because my reaction time is really not much better than a tenth of a second. Now, I will show you something else, which is quite interesting, and that is how the behavior of the period is on the, on the mass of the object. I have here another car, which weighs roughly the same. Uh, I'm going to add the two together, and so we get M2 is about 372 plus or minus one gram. The plus or minus one comes in because our scale is no more accurate than one gram. So we put them both on the scale and we find this to be the uncertainty. So now I'm going to measure the ten periods of this object with mass M2, so twice the mass. So that should be the square root of M2 divided by M1 times ten times the period of M1. And so I can make a prediction, because this is the square root of 2, and I know what this is. So I will take my calculator, and I will take the square root of 2, and I multiply that by, uh, let's take 15.15. And so that comes out to be 21.42, 21.42, 
21.42. It's not clear that this 2 is meaningful. And now comes the $64 question. What is the uncertainty? This is a prediction. And this now becomes a little tricky. So what I'm telling you now may confuse you a bit. It's not meant to be, but I really won't hold you responsible for it. You may now think that the uncertainty in this measurement follows from the uncertainty in this, which is true, which is about 0.6%, and from the uncertainty in this. So this has about an uncertainty of 0.6%. I got it low because I measured 10 oscillations, you see. The uncertainty is only 1 out of 150, which is low. You may think that the uncertainty in there equals the square root of 372 plus or minus 1 divided by 186 plus or minus 1. And now you may argue, and it's completely reasonable that you would argue that way, you would say, well, this is roughly a quarter of a percent error here under the square root, and this is roughly half a percent error. One out of 200 is about half. So you would add up the two errors, a quarter plus half, that's about 0.7. And because of the square root, that becomes 0.35%. And that's wrong. And the reason why that is completely wrong, that has to do with the fact that these two errors are coupled to each other. See, we, the 186 is included in the 372. The best way I can show you this, suppose I measured M1 divided by M1, which would be 186 plus or minus 1 divided by 186 plus or minus 1. That number is one with 100 zeros. This number is one. You, you have the mass of one object, you divide it by the same object. Whereas if you would say, ah, this is a half a percent error, and this is a half a percent error, you would say the ratio has an error of one percent, and that's not the case. So I will not bother you with that. I will not hold you responsible for that. But it turns out that if you do it correctly, and you take the error of this into account of about 0.6 percent, that the error in this ratio is really much less than 0.2 percent. You can almost forget about it. I will allow generously for a 1 percent error in the final answer. And so I stick to my prediction that the 10 t of double the mass is going to be like this. And now we're going to get the observation. 10 t times m2, which is double the mass. And that, of course, always has my uncertainty of my reaction time. There's nothing I can do about that. And we will compare these two numbers. So I will put the, the other mass on top of it. It comes here. Tape them together so that they won't fall off. There we go. So I hope I did that correctly, the square root of 2 times 15.15. We'll give it a amplitude something like 30, maybe 35 centimeters. There we go. One, two, it's much slower, eh? you see that. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I'm not looking, ten. 21.36. 21.36. You can round it off to four if you want to, and you see that the agreement is spectacular. Within the uncertainty of my measurements, it comes out amazingly well. You could have removed this too, of course, because if you have an uncertainty of 0.2 here, it's a little silly to have this little two hanging there. But you see that indeed this spring is very close to an ideal spring. It obeys Hooke's law, and it is also nearly massless. Here is the pendulum. Here is the mass, and it's offset at an angle theta. The length of the pendulum is L, the length of the string. There is gravity here, mg, and the other force on the object, the only other force is the tension don't confuse that with period t. This is tension t. It's a Newton's. Those are the only two forces. There is nothing else. The thing is going to arc around like this, and it's going to oscillate. I call this the y direction, and I call this the x direction, and here x equals zero. 
Well, I'm going to decompose the 